Hello and welcome back to the CSENT journey with me, Ryan. In this next section, we're going to have a discussion around the transmission control protocol and the user datagram protocol. We're going to have an overview of what's the differences between them and what's the key elements that you need to remember, understand before your exam and your career in networking. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, on LinkedIn or Twitter. So before we start, those who have been following the video series would have known that we've just finished a good overview of the Open System Interconnect model and we had a discussion around these seven layers and TCP and UDP are two protocols that work at a particular layer. Hopefully you can tell by looking at this which layer they work at. Layer 4 is where the TCP and UDP live which is the transport layer Remember that when we talk about the transport layer, the PDU, the protocol data unit at the transport layer is referred to as a segment. So what we're going to do now is jump in and have a comparison between the two protocols. Okay, so what we're going to do is start with the UDP, the user datagram protocol. And after the user datagram protocol, we're going to jump into the transmission control protocol and then a quick comparison at the end. So. UDP, what do you have to know about it? First of all, it's a connectionless protocol. And because it's connectionless, it's an unreliable protocol. And because it doesn't have the ability to be connection orientated and it's not reliable, we can actually have lower overhead. So, what do I mean by that? It's a smaller PDU. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail. And because it's smaller, it tends to offer more speed. Let's say, for example, we have a server. That server itself is somewhere out on the internet and we have a PC that needs to communicate with this server. The server itself is running something called TFTP which is the Trivial File Transfer Protocol and for those who don't know this runs at port 69 and we mentioned in a previous video these ports if they're between 0 to 1023, it's in the well-known port range. If you don't know what that is, it's wise to kind of watch the previous video that we've discussed in detail what that actually is. Now, let's say this PC needs to communicate with the server. It's going to upload some data. First things first, it's going to create its data itself. And the data includes the upper layers which is the application, the presentation, and the session. We're then going to use UDP at layer 4. We're then going to use IP at layer 3, Ethernet at layer 2, and then obviously the bits at layer 1. Now as it sends it out, because it's UDP, what it's not going to do is it's not going to check whether that server even exists. It's not going to send any traffic to the server to say, hey server, I'm about to send you some traffic. Essentially what it would do is it would just send that traffic out. When that traffic, and hopefully it does, reaches the server, let's say for example three, three bits of traffic were sent out, the server itself isn't going to send an acknowledgement back to confirm that it was received. So the downside with this is because the PC doesn't check it's there and because the server doesn't acknowledge the traffic that the PC was sent, it doesn't actually allow the communication to be reliable because it doesn't set up a connection. And because this connection is set up, the PC is also unaware of how busy the server actually is. So for example, if off the back of this PC, or the back of this LAN where this server is actually situated, there's let's say a switch and off the back of the switch there's another PC that's fully utilizing the NIC the network interface card of the server so the server itself is running at 99% utilization this PC down here will continue to send full speed all the traffic it needs to actually upload to the server not knowing that maybe a high percentage of that traffic is actually being dropped if this was maybe something like TCP then they would have some sort of acknowledgement between them and this PC would know actually I only can send 
let's say, one packet or so, I can't send as many as I try to send with UDP. So, what does this mean? It means that UDP is a connectionless protocol. It doesn't check the servers there, it doesn't worry about acknowledgements, and because it can't worry about acknowledgements and check the servers there, it can't control the flow of traffic. So there's no flow control. What it also doesn't do is it doesn't do retransmissions. So if the PC sends traffic, it doesn't know if it got there, and because it doesn't know it gets there, it instantly deletes it from the cache of the PC itself. What we do is when we come to WAT TCP and we have a discussion around retransmissions, we'll see that that's a little bit different behavior there. We also can't tell the order of the packets. So let's say this PC goes to this server, because it goes across the internet, it might take different paths to reach the destination. So one flow might go this way, another flow might go that way, and so forth. And because of that, the server itself may receive traffic out of order. And depending on the application, that could cause problems. So UDP is connectionless, is unreliable. Low overhead, what do I mean by this? At layer four, which is where our segments are, and we call PDUs, protocol data units. We call PDUs at layer four segments. So our UDP segments, because it doesn't have to worry about the connection, the sequencing, flow controls, retransmissions, and so forth, there's not much more to put into the header itself. So when we blow up and look inside the UDP header, you'll notice there's not actually much in there. There's just a source port, which is that ephemeral port, the destination port, which depending on the application could be part of that well-known port range, something like a checksum and length, so how big the UDP actual segment is. There's not much in there. We we'll see with TCP, there's a lot more information inside the header itself, and because there's a lot more information, it allows us to have this retransmission, the acknowledgements, flow controls, ordering of packets, and so forth. So that was a overview of the UDP protocol, and you're probably wondering at this stage why we would ever want to use UDP, when on the other hand, we could have our communications acknowledged, we could control the flow, and have it retransmitted in the correct order if it needed it. And the reason for that is because some applications require it to be lightweight, little overhead, and as quick as possible. So for example, we think about VoIP, voice over IP. If we had two PCs communicating using a VoIP application, let's say Skype, what we need is because the communication is going to be in real time, we need it to be sent as quickly as possible, with as small packets as possible, with a less overhead, so it requires less processing and in turn it's easier to build at the other side. So for example, time this person even says a sentence, it's sent across the wire, what we don't want is this PC here to realize that half the sentence was maybe missing and to send an acknowledgement for retransmission because time that acknowledgement and retransmission has happened, the conversation has already moved on. Otherwise what's going to happen is the conversation moved on and then time this reply comes back, it would be uh, an out of, order, out of order conversation and it wouldn't make much sense. Instead what happens with VoIP using UDP is if the information wasn't successfully received, it simply just drops and you normally say to the person, hey, can you repeat what you said? And there are some protocols that actually use UDP. So we think things like DNS, the domain name system, this allows us to convert URLs like, for example, www.google.com to an IP address. DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This actually supplies IP addresses to host on the LAN or host in another LAN using a relay feature. We also have things like RIP, the Routing Information Protocol, which is a routing protocol that's used to communicate subnets and prefixes to other routers and we'll get into rep as we continue in our video series we also got things that I mentioned earlier like the trivial file transfer protocol now not only do we remember sort of a handful of these sort of more common UDP applications but we also got to remember what ports they run on remember I talked previously about the well-known ports it's important that you memorize the well-known ports of these applications 
and in the text that you'll be reading that would assist you through the CSET certifications, it would list normally sort of five to seven protocols for both TCP and UDP and the port numbers that you need to remember. So moving on to the TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, let's have a quick discussion around this. TCP is connection orientated. It's reliable and it uses the acknowledgements and the read transmissions to achieve that. It has flow control, but it has higher overhead. So we go back to what we had earlier, where we had a remote server. This server is actually a HTTP server that's running the HTTP process, which listens, which is an important keyword, listens on port 80 TCP. Now this particular server itself connects into the internet somewhere and off the back of that we have our gateway device that we're plugged into as a PC. The PC is going to send a HTTP get message because it wants some sort of HTML web page from the remote server. Now before it does that what it's going to do, unlike UDP, is it's going to set up a connection. So first of all, it will acknowledge or essentially find out if this server actually even exists and if it's listening on port 80 and whether it can form a communication with that server, unlike UDP, which just sends it out. And it does that using a three-way handshake. The three-way handshake has three steps to it. The first step is the sync. The second step is the synac. And the third step is the ACK. What happens is PC1 will essentially send a SYN. The server will respond with a synac, acknowledging that it's received its SYN and also acknowledging that any TCP options and parameters are agreed upon and then the PC will then reply with a final ACK. Once that's been done and that session's been set up, the devices themselves will then start to send traffic to one another. And the way that works, it's, it uses a sequencing method and the sequencing method allows it to essentially double up as an acknowledgement if something isn't acknowledged, then it can be retransmitted. So for example, let's say this PC wants to send three segments to the remote host. It will build the three segments together and it will place the three segments into a local retransmission queue. And it will never remove those from the retransmission queue unless certain parameters are hit. One of those parameters being until it gets an acknowledgement from the server. The three segments are then sent across the wire to the server and the server will then, nine out of ten times to begin with, send individual acknowledgements back for each packet. Once the host receives those three acknowledgements back, it will remove those three segments from the retransmission queue and create more segments to be sent. Let's say it will send five segments. The five segments will go up and the server may acknowledge all five with their own individual acts. Again, it will be removed from the retransmission queue. Let's say at this point, the host itself decides to send one, two, three, four, five, six, seven segments to the remote server. Now, the remote server then only sends five acknowledgements back. This tells the sending PC two things. One, it's allowed to remove the five that was received from the retransmission queue and the two that wasn't acknowledged will get resent. What the communication doesn't tell the sending PC or is why the information was dropped. In fact, we don't kind of care. All we do know is we sent seven out, we only got five back, so there must have been something somewhere that caused two of the segments to be dropped. So the server will then essentially wait for the two or at this point the server doesn't know those two segments are missing because he's only ever received five 
and he's acknowledged those five. The two are resent from the PC, and once the server gets them, he sends the two acknowledgements back, and again, they're then removed from the retransmission queue. What would have happened also is because only five was initially acknowledged, and this host down here had to resend two, it may then think to itself, actually, I know not to send seven again, so I'm actually only going to send four. Because I know when I sent seven, not all of them were successfully, successfully received. Maybe that was due to congestion on the network. So only four is to be sent, and hopefully the server will then acknowledge the four back. This is how the flow control is handled. Through the use of acknowledgement from the remote host, the sending PC is allowed to tune down how much traffic is being sent on the segment. It doesn't necessarily tell you why it's busy, whether that's because the server itself is busy or whether it's because the path you're taking is overutilized, but it does give you an understanding of ensuring the traffic is there, and if it's not there, allows for it to be retransmitted and allows you to control the flow. This is why we think of TCP as a connection orientated protocol because it creates that connection using the three-way handshake. It uses sequencing to ensure that the packets are sent and acknowledged. And if those packets are not acknowledged, it's able to retransmit. And if the packets are not acknowledged the way they should be, so for example, we receive five instead of seven acknowledgements, that allows us to identify the flow control and actually control the traffic that the PC is actually sending to the server. Now there are a lot of complexities around TCP and how this acknowledgement, retransmission, flow control and how it actually creates that three-way handshake. So a quick overview then with the protocol side by side. TCP stands for the Transmission Control Protocol and it's a connection orientated protocol. UDP is the User Datagram Protocol and it's a connectionless protocol. Remember this creates the three-way handshake this doesn't, this just sends the traffic out without checking anything. TCP is primarily used for applications that require high reliability and less critical about speed. On the other hand, UDP is all about the speed and not about the reliability. Protocols that use TCP include port 80, FTP, POP3, Telnet and SMTP. Important to remember all the ports that run on these protocols, and same applies to UDP. UDP uses DNS, VoIP, DHCP, TFTP, and RIP. It's reliable, and it's reliable through the use of sequence. So every single segment that gets sent out gets a sequence number, and depending on the acknowledgements that come back from the sequence number, allows it to actually control the flow and ensure that the traffic is reliable because any traffic that's not acknowledged is retransmitted but because it has this flow control the sequencing etc the overhead itself so the actual pdu size is much greater than udp it has less overhead because it doesn't have the reliability that's required like the flow control sequencing acknowledgements and so forth. Lastly, I hope this lesson has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing and if it has been, please do like and subscribe.